How do we measure value? Why is trust so crucial to the functioning of the global economy? What is truth? And how can new technologies like blockchains, oracles, and smart contracts facilitate fair and transparent economies? These are questions that we'll be answering over the next few months in a new Chainlink Research Reports research series on the economics of Web3. Together with renowned scholars from across the globe, the series looks at research that asks big picture questions about the role that blockchain and smart contracts are playing in the wider economy, from global supply chains to health information and beyond. Join us each week as we discuss new and exciting research on Web3 economics and policy. And now, here's a short clip from our first interview with Yale University economist Ali Savinsky on the economics of NFTs. The full interview will be premiering right here on the Chainlink YouTube channel. Hope you can join us. The good thing about being a classically trained economist, especially economists at Yale, is that some of these questions were asked and answered, in fact, before for different asset classes. So in particular, what is the right parallel between NFTs and some other asset classes? Well, think about uh, real estate. If we had this conversation, Jason, with you, circa 1975, would be having the same kind of questions. You know, there's a bunch of, bunch of houses. Each house is unique. You take a house in Manhattan, there is a million dollar house, which is a tiny studio apartment in a fancy building. There is a nice you know, four bedroom apartment somewhere you know, on, the, on the outskirts uh, of Manhattan. So the houses are unique. The houses are rarely traded. They're illiquid, and we don't have the data for it. Well, how do you price, how do you create an index of these kinds of assets? Well, uh, the idea for, for this was, in fact, I think done in the 60s, maybe even earlier than that, by uh, Bailey, Muth, and Norse. And I think it's called BMN Index, and it was in, in the 60s. And the idea was to say, well, let's look at the repeated same. So I'm going to look at the house being bought and then being sold. In some sense, the price of the house incorporates all of the desirable characteristics of the house. Now, I have, a, I have say, $500,000, I can buy a tiny studio, or I can buy a more palatial apartment. But then, depending on preference and so on and so on, the price summarizes, in some sense, all of the characteristics. Of the individual of the individual properties, and then uh, my colleague Bob Schiller here at Yale, together with Case, essentially said, "Well, how about we just do exactly the same thing as Bailey at all, but apply them to the housing market?" And the very famous, the standard, the most important index of real estate prices appeared, and that's a case in Schiller. Like so what Bob did, Bob first um, collected the data for the individual transactions at the individual level of the zip code, and then he created an index of repeated sales. So what is this index? What is K-Shore index? Really, the K-Shore index is something very simple. The K-Shore index just says, well, we have different changes in prices by, which were observed by different transactions. And the K-Shore index is the common component of this transaction. So think about the price of an individual house being driven by broadly two components, the individual characteristic, number of rooms, location, uh, the exact building it, it, it is in, and the overall index sale real estate in the United States. At the level down, maybe it's index of the overall uh, real estate in Manhattan or in San Francisco, then going down to a particular, particular zip code. So that was the most important innovation, I think, in the real estate market that allowed all kinds of other things. It allowed uh, the explosion of all of the CMOs, CDOs, all of the derivative instruments on the housing. It allowed, most importantly, the securitization 
of the housing market where you had a bunch of different assets which were rarely tradable, illiquid, and so on, which all of a sudden became an asset. So suppose we're sitting in 1975, you and I would be thinking, of how do I get exposure to the real estate market? Housing Manhattan is expensive, housing Palo Alto is expensive. Should I buy a place in Charlotte? Should I buy a place in Des Moines? It's just expensive. Maybe I can fractionalize it somehow. But instead, the idea was, okay, let's just have some exposure to, in some sense, to the index or to the something that allows you to bet on the, on the uh, housing market whatsoever. So I strongly believe in learning from standing on the shoulders of the giants, in this case, it's Bob Schiller. And what we have done is we essentially implemented the repeated sale methodology that was done for you know, all of these other markets, art market, et cetera, uh, for the NFT market. For the NFT market, there are some certain peculiarities there because the data is, is more tricky to do, but I don't think it's as, it was easy for Bob Schiller to do this in the, in the 1975, the internet and so on. Thank you.